Hey y'all, I'm April. And I'm Caroline. And this is your bloody happy hour. Caroline, are you ready for this? This is your newest guilty pleasure. It's the bloodiest part of your week. Did we say something about it also being happy hour? Show sure did. Because we're about to be sipping on some murder. Bloody happy hour. Hey, y'all, this is April. (laughs) Always when you're drinking. And this is Caroline. (laughs) Well, you know, if we're not professional, I don't know who is. Yeah, I know. That is what you call pros. Pros and hoes. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Are you having a bloodiest happy hour ever today, April? You know? It's pretty bloody, but wow. I don't have a happy hour right oh, now. Oh, that's I know. okay. I'm sucking. I'm sucking. I'm actually drinking some Spower Powerade <laughs> sports drink. Spower. I love Spowerade. I am rehydrating from last night, and it's also a Sunday. And um, yep, we're recording on Sunday just for y'all. Day. It's off day, um, but I did have my Four Sigmatic coffee. Well, there you go. I Tell know. me about Four Sigmatic. Listen. This story is going to be on point because I have so much clarity and focus. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And I I sipped on it this week while I was working, and I got, you know, all the reports written. Wow. Like the flash. So, guys, if you like coffee, this is like fortified coffee, right? Fortified, yes. Yeah, with like mushrooms and plants and good stuff and... Not the mushrooms. It's going to make you hallucinate. Eat your yeah, yeah, no, yeah, no, not no not, Austin hair off mushrooms. Not Austin no. hair off mushrooms. None of that at all. Um, and if you don't like coffee, you can get some protein powder. Can you get some cacao? You can get some cacao. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or you can get, just get some regular old elixirs or blends that you can put in your tea if you don't like coffee, or in your smoothies, or if in your soups. And if you want to try this out, it's actually really popular. You can go to what's their website? Um, it's go dot foursigmatic dot com slash happy hour. Yes. And when you put that happy hour in there, that gives you a thirty percent off code. Um, did we know did you know that there was a coffee shortage during the World War Two? Oh yeah, I did. Actually, it was during World War Two. War War Two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, I did know that, and um, but I'm glad that you reminded me. And that's why that's how they figured this out is because there was a shortage, and so they would brew mushrooms. Wow, in lieu of coffee. I mean, I I'm here for it. I'm yeah. here for it, and um, also, do you know what four sigmatic means? What is it? Oh, it's just a sciencey way of saying really good for you. Oh, okay, oh, okay. So then. I'm convinced. Yep. Go order you some right now, y'all. And let's get to the episode. Oh, okay. Let's do it. Can we talk about a serial killer? It's been a little bit. I can't wait. This serial killer is the father, basically, of the serial killers. He is, we did a month where we were like OG serial killers, Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. He is before them. He came before the term serial killer was a term. Ooh. He wow. actually helped them coin the term. Oh, wow. Oh, gosh. Well, he helped them research. It's not answer Zodiac. Answer questions. It's Zodiac? It's not Zodiac. <coughs> he, um. I just remember in the show. Mindhunters? No. What? With Jake Gyllenhaal? Uh, broke back it's mountain. called Z- <laughs> <laughs> yes i remember in that gay porn uh, no i uh it it was actually called zodiac oh okay the movie yeah, yeah, yeah uh and i thought that's where they had they had at least in the movie that's where they mm-hmm. started saying it or used it okay but yeah well so uh, he also was featured on Mind Hunters. Remember the yes. oh, Netflix gosh. show? Why did that only have two seasons? I know. I, let's write a letter. Okay, Mind Hunter. They talked about BTK. They talked about Zodiac a little bit. They talked about um, Kemper. Kemper. They talked about Manson. Uh huh. How about a guy named Jerry Brudos? 
Brudos. I remember them talking about Brudos, but I don't ever know. I don't. I, I didn't know. Like he's yeah. so behind the scenes. Um, and I don't even know. Okay, I remember during the episode, and they showed him. I was like, wait, why don't I know about him? And he's pretty legit. I know. Why did you decide to do this guy? Because I was just thinking of that scene on the episode, and we were talking about fetishes is what it was. When we did the diaper fetish episode. Oh, yeah. We had two, and I was like, ooh, let me, fetishes are real weird. Let me find one. And then I stumbled on Jerry Brudos again. So wow. I want to start. I, I listened to a book. It's called Lust Killer by Ann Rule. Ann Rule. Yes, badass Ann Rule. We've I'm gonna done a couple to of hers. Catherine Ramsland's books after this. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um and so it's a great book. It's a great read, you guys. If if you love reading, this is a good book. Uh so it's called Lust Killer. And that he was coined as Lust Killer or the Shoe Fetish Killer. But I'm gonna start off with right here. January 26, 1968, 19-year-old Linda Slauson had just started a new job selling encyclopedias. She had just moved to Portland, Oregon from a whole other state, and she didn't really like this job. She was dressed up, nice dress and some nice heels because she wanted to look professional, and her job was to walk these neighborhoods in Portland, Oregon, and try to sell people encyclopedias. Wow. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and it was hard to do, but if she sold just a set, she'd be able to pay, like, rent and bills for a month. So it would have been a lucrative job. Yeah. Um, if she ever sold anything, but she didn't. Oh, yeah. She was kind of discouraged just this day because um, it has been a long day. She hadn't sold anything. It was dark. It was rainy. And she just wanted it to be over. She was just over it. Yeah. So she had one last lead, and they she had an appointment with a potential buyer. And so she pulled something out of her, like her little receipt for the address. Mm -hmm. And because it was raining, it kind of got wet. She couldn't really read the address. She didn't know where she was. So she looked up and was looked down the road, and there was this guy in the front yard who just kind of waved at her and smiled. And so she was thinking, oh, I bet this is who I'm supposed to meet with. He looks like he's happy to see me. So she... Is like, let me just go get this over with because I'm going to go home and take a cold shower. So she waved and she says, um, I had an appointment. Is this the house? And it was this big, like, pudgy, redhead, freckle-faced guy. And he was like, yes, come on in. But instead of going into the front door, he takes her arm and he takes her around the corner and leads, us, leads them to his basement. Oh, no. Yes. Not the basement. Not the basement, buddy, oh, she goes. No. And so for a minute, she had that thought like, Ooh, do I want to go? Do I, should I do this? Should I do this? But he was so interested in encyclopedias. He was like, ooh, I love encyclopedias. It'll be great for the kids. <laughs> um, my wife has company, so it'll be quieter down here. I can't wait to see what you have. So she was like, oh, easy sale. Oh, so yeah. Go I mean, I would have totally f fallen for it. <laughs> I would be in the basement. Yeah. Yes, you would have. Yeah. Yeah, I would already be. You would have suggested the basement. I'm like, hey, let's try the basement. Yeah. I think Instead that's a good spot. It's cooler room. in there and I get hot easily. Yeah. So, so um, they get down there and she he pulled up a stool for her and she mm -hmm. just got in her briefcase and she started her pitch and he gets up and he goes to turn on the light because he says he can't see or get it. He says, well, let me get this other light I can't see. When he gets behind her, he oh grabs no. a two by four oh and he no. hits her oh no. in the bed, in the back of the head. Mm. Um, Too down. He wrapped his hands around her neck and he strangled her. Watched the life leave her body. And he's exhilarated because now she belongs to him to do Gosh. whatever he wanted to do. Now, he didn't like her hair, <laughs> but he loved her heels. Oh, oh wow. It sounds like BTK. He wanted to put her clothes on or something. He wanted to make sure there are no interruptions. So he walked upstairs. His mom was watching, was there. 
watching the kids for him. And he says, hey, I'm hungry. Why don't y'all go eat dinner? Here's some money. Eat there. <laughs> when you get ready to go, bring me a double meat, double cheeseburger. Oh, Lord. <laughs> and, um, and call me before you come. Call me from the restaurant before you're on your way. Okay? Yeah. So they left, and now his fun begins. She was his to play with. He removed her panties and her undergarments and her slip and her bra, and they were all perfect. It was the perfect material. They were the perfect colors. He removed, took it all off, and then he redressed her like a doll. And he thought about having sex with her, but he didn't need to because the panties and the bras and redressing her was enough. He did this over and over for hours. He had his own set of clothes that he could dress her into. And panties and bras and stuff. Like he had like like a treasure a chest of this stuff like mm-hmm. that other guy. Mm-hmm. This was his dream. Um, but he was mad at himself because he didn't have any film in his camera. But he said, next time, next time I'll be more prepared. He took a little break and he went upstairs and he went and ate his burger. And he talked to his wife and he kissed them good night and he says i'll be working late in his workshop Ugh. so he went back down there and he had to play right he played with her till about two in the morning they played house they played dress up okay till about two in the morning and he knew he had to get rid of her but he just needed to keep a piece of her one piece to remember so he grabs a hacksaw and he cuts off her left foot, slips it into her own high heel, and he puts it in his freezer so it, for safekeeping for later <gasps> on. Her foot in, in the shoe. Her foot in the high okay, heel. Okay, that's different. In the freezer. That's a little odd. And it was time to get rid of her. So he drove to a local bridge and... He was smart. He thought this out on the way. He says, you know, every time I stop and change my tire, nobody stops to help me. So I'm going to pretend like I got a flat tire. So he got the jack out. He jacked up his car. He even, like, took off the tire. um, And people just drove by. (laughs) He tied a rope. Some ugly fat guy on the side of the road. Uh, Yeah. So... And some wire around her and attach the other end to an engine head. Like a head, those things weigh like 150 pounds. And he dumped her over the bridge into the Wilmot River. What do you mean an engine? He took his engine out of his car? He had, he works, he he helped people work on cars. And so oh. he just had an extra one <laughs> like in his truck. not going to be able to go anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> He had an extra one lying around. So just something heavy that would sink her. That would sink her down. So he threw her and that engine head over and the bridge. His family's just at home? Yeah. And they're, they're like... Sleeping. Yeah, he's like, I had to work late. Yeah. It was just so easy. He heard her splash. And he went back home. Her job assumed she quit because she never showed up again. <laughs> her family filed a report... Her body would never be found. Oh, my gosh. So, let's meet Jerry Brodus. Well, it's not. Brutus. Brodus. I don't, I don't know. Brutus. Brutus, yeah. yeah. I'll probably go back and forth. So, he was born in 1939 in South Dakota. He was the second born child. He had an older brother named Larry. His name was Jerry. And he had a mama named Eileen. That's, oh, no. Yeah. Come on, Eileen. <laughs> yeah. Eileen's going to let us down a little bit. Now, when Eileen and dad found out they were pregnant, they were like hoping for a girl and hoping for a girl because they already had Larry, older brother Larry. Mm. Well, came out Jerry, and they were disappointed, and they were disappointed in him for the rest of his <laughs> life. Like, he came out, and they weren't even happy. No, they were like, like oh, can we return him? Yeah. <laughs> Go, don't even leave him in the room yeah. with me. Oh, Just go did take you him lose him? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> so his mom, his whole life made him feel like he was a mistake, like he was not enough. 
and like she hated him. And so, of course, at a young age, he starts despising his mom, too. Um, when they talk about the mom, the mom was real proper, like real plain. She dressed nice, but never dressed up, never wore heels. At age five, it's so crazy that this is where his fetish starts. So he was playing around in a junkyard and he found some black, shiny leather heels. He had never seen anything like them before. His mom wore like these chunky little gross things all the time. (laughs) And so he was so obsessed with these heels. So he took them home and he was so excited. He's five. Yeah. What do you think he did with them? Put them on. Yeah. I mean, like, you just, there's different yeah. type of shoe. They go on your feet. You put them on. He w- pranced around the house. And his mom was furious. She yelled. She berated him. She called him naughty boy and demanded him to go take them back to the junkyard. Well, he hadn't, he didn't understand why she wanted him to get rid of them. So he just went and hid them under his bed in his room. And he would play with them you know, in his room a lot, and she found them, and she set them on fire in front of him. Oh, no. (laughs) And the psychologist will later say, this right here changed the trajectory of his life. So what you're saying is, if you have a child who is trying on shoes girls shoes maybe of a sibling, Uh and they walk around in those shoes, maybe they also dress up in their... They're princess dresses, and they're a boy. It's okay. They're just... You don't make a big deal about it. Okay, don't make and a big deal about it. And then you don't what else berate do you do? them. Don't berate them. And then you don't, um, like, embarrass them and make it taboo, because when it's taboo, they want it even more. Okay, so for you listeners out there who have kids that do that, <laughs> there you go. You're welcome. Free information. Yeah, you won't have a serial killer kid now. But you still might, so sorry. So, when he would get upset, like, she set the shoes on fire, and he was so upset. Well, he did have a nice little neighbor lady that was more like a mom to him than his mom ever was. And he would run down to her house, and she would give him cookies, and she loved on him. There was no physical touch in the household. Mom would never, like, hug him or kiss him or pat him on the back or shake him his hand or anything. But this old lady was very nice to him, and he loved her. And he had one little friend, he called his little girlfriend, that she was always nice to him too. But then back to back, they both died. The little girl turned out she had tuberculosis and died. Oh, hey. And the old lady had horrible diabetes. And she got really sick and was not able to see him anymore. And then she eventually died. Wow. He refers to this as tragedy in his home because the only two women in his life at that time that showed him any type of love were now gone. Um, and all he had was his love for high heels. Oh no. So his teacher one day walks in with some nice high heels and she would wear, she wore them, but she had a second set of, she would put them in her desk drawer in the classroom and wear a more comfortable Mm -hmm. pair of shoes. So she had two pairs of shoes. So Jerry takes them out of the drawer and he goes and hides them under the toys in the back of the room because he wanted to take them home because his mama burned his heels. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he um, did that, but another kid found them and gave them back to the teacher. And the teacher was just like, she was like, why? How did my heels end up here? This is so weird. Jerry ended up confessing and said it was me because he really, really liked them. And now this teacher started teaching him I mean started treating him totally different oh yeah so now the two women that's left in his life mama and teacher treat him like shit (laughs) oh no because they know he's a weirdo yeah clearly um he learned at an early age that he could not count on women and this is probably where his despise of women really started okay so the house, the household was there, like everything was forbidden. It was like Bobby Boucher's mom. Okay, like you, could, there was no physical touch. Dad couldn't touch mom. Mom couldn't touch the kids. The kids couldn't touch each other. Not a hug. Not anything. 
And this was like the 30s, 40s, sorry, it's the 40s. So there's not really a lot of porn. Everything on TV is very appropriate. Are there mm. TVs then? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Black and white? Yeah. So he had these fetishes, and but they were only to tangible things. And his fetish grew from heels to panties, bras, slips, pantyhose, women's undergarments. He knew, he knew at this time that the heels made him feel good, but what he actually learned later on is that they actually turned him on. Oh. He didn't know what a really what an erection was back then. He uh -uh. just knew that no. whenever he saw heels, things would happen, and he liked it. So interesting. I know. How does that happen? How does shoes do that to you? You made them taboo. She should have just let them wear high heels. <sighs> As a young kid. I don't know. I um, he would, <clears throat> his fetish like continued on until um, like puberty, during puberty, mm -hmm. and then on into his teen years, Okay. So when he was younger, he would, if he went to, if him and his brother went to friend's house, he would sneak into the girl's room and he would steal like a pair of their panties. Or then he started trying on their clothes. Yeah. At 16, he had his first wet dream, which to me is like, wow, that's, that's late, I would think. A 16-year-old and this is the first time you're having your wet dream. And then it must have been really wet because mama saw the stains on the sheets. Oh! <laughs> And you didn't just mamas the again, mamas again, you know, she had to berate, berate him and mm. yell at him and made him hand wash his own jizz off the sheet. <laughs> 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 and he had to sleep without sheets for a while because he didn't deserve sheets oh, anymore. No. And he was just so confused because he had no idea why it happened. He had no idea what it was. And he did it in his sleep. So it's not even like he was masturbating yeah. or doing anything. It was just like an accident. Okay. Shit like that happens, y'all. Moms, don't be doing that. He soon started fantasizing about controlling women. So his dream, his fantasies was he wanted to dig a hole, dig a tunnel, and he wanted to trap women down there. And he wanted to take full control of them. But the fantasy would kind of stop there because he didn't know, like, what to do with them. He didn't know what their body looked like. He had never seen a woman's body. Like, so he don't know what it looked, what the boobs are. He don't know what a vagina is at this time. So where nor a normal, not a normal person, but a normal serial killer is already fantasizing about rape. He doesn't know how to fantasize about rape because he doesn't know anything about sex. Oh. God. So he just fantasizes about their brawls, their underwear, their heels, and about having total control of them. And this it's just a weird fantasy. Mm -hmm. A weird fantasy. Mm. And then he starts, you know, back then you would hang your stuff up on the clotheslines. Mm -hmm. He would start stealing the neighborhood brawls. <laughs> That were on the clothesline. Panties lines. that were hanging on the clothesline because that's the only time he saw any because his mom, parents made sure oh my gosh, he never saw So weird to think about clotheslines. <laughs> and people hung it outside. Yes. He he had favorite fabric. Like he loved the silky ones. He loved like the, the colorful ones, like the reds and the blacks. Of course. So at 18 years old, he um, went to a neighbor's house, and he had stolen some of her lingerie, okay, mm. that was hanging up, some of her bras, and then he gets an idea, and he's like, you know what, I just want to see what, what what's the purpose of those bras? What does it do? What's under those bras? What's under those underwear when those when the women wear them, like, I want to see what it looks like. So he goes and he knocks on his neighbor's door, the neighbor that he just stole all the lingerie from, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And he goes, hey, you know, there's a neighborhood underwear thief. <laughs> and I'm actually working undercover with the police. I need to see if this fits you. <laughs> I'm working undercover with the police. And I think you may be able to get your stuff back. I'm going to go and have a meeting with the police. You should come to my house at, you know, 6 o'clock this evening, and we'll get a plan down because I think I can give you your stuff. We can <laughs> find them and give your stuff back. And so she was just like, 
yeah, give me my yeah, Sears yeah, where underwear. Is it? Where's my where's my bra? And so she goes over to his house, just like he asks, and she knocks on the door, and she hears somebody say, come in. So she comes in, and she goes up to the stairs, and when she goes upstairs, out of the closet comes a masked man. He had a mask on. Oh, no. And he throws her down, and he makes her take off all her clothes, and then he makes her pose for pictures. So he's got his, like, old-school camera and film (laughs) roll, and he's taking pictures, and he's taking pictures, and she's posing, and she's crying. Oh, my gosh. And when the film is up, he takes off down, out the room, down the stairs, and out the door. So she's scared to death. She's crying. She puts her clothes back on, and she goes down the stairs, and when she opens up the door, there's Jerry, the neighbor who said he's working undercover with the police and he goes hey are you okay did you see anybody i was trapped in the barn some guy in a mask trapped me in the barn and i'm sorry i couldn't meet you are you okay and she just pushed past him and she goes home and cries and she never reports this she later says she knew it was jerry but she was too scared to report him so this motherfucker just Put on a mask. He kept his same clothes on. He put on a mask, <laughs> pretended like he was this mask robber, and then ran down the stairs, took off the mask, and then was like, oh, here I am. Oh, Sorry, I was trapped in a barn. And she didn't even... She knew. She, she never didn't... reported. Well, that's... She never reported it. Okay. I don't know why she did that. This was his first time. So he has the cameras, the pictures developed, and he finally gets to see what a vagina is. And he finally gets to see what boobs are. Oh, and no. he used them and used them and used them. He doesn't even know the act of masturbation. He just... Um, ejaculates kind of without it. Oh. Yeah. Like it's that... It's kind of like when at BTK, like he didn't even need to masturbate or one of our killers we did, it just kind of came... It just kind of came, but it, he did not even need to stroke it. So this is what the pictures did for him for a long time. Oh, gosh. But then they got old because he used them so much. And so at 17, he was over the pictures, and he was like, um, I'm going to get another girl, and I'm going to do this again. So he's in high school, and he convinces one of the high school girls to get in the car with him and to take him a ride. And then he starts talking to her like they are boyfriend and girlfriend, and she's like, ew. <laughs> So they pull over on the side of the road, and she tries to get out, and he's beating her ass. Beating her ass, beating her ass, and another couple is driving by, and they see him beating her. So they pull over, and they grab him, and he goes, I'm just trying to save her. Somebody else was beating her, and he took off running. And so he tried to turn the story around like he was the hero (laughs) saving her. Well, the couple didn't believe it. They called the police, and he ended up getting arrested for assault and battery, okay? Okay. And then they went and they searched his room, and they found pictures, and they found all the stolen underwear and all the stolen bras, and they knew he was a pervert, but this is not normal, you know? No. Why does this man? Why does this 17-year-old boy want heels and panties and have these pictures of this naked girl? Um, and so they committed him to the Oregon State Hospital. Oh, good. good. And he was diagnosed with a fetishistic, fetishistic, <laughs> fetishistic disorder okay. and maladaptive behaviors. Huh? But this was a special hospital because he got to go to school every day. He had to go spend the night every night in the hospital at night. But then every morning he got to get up and go to school like a normal high school person. He graduated that way at 18 years old, and right before he was released from the hospital, they diagnosed him as schizophrenic. Okay. This is later, like, um, described as, like, they later took that back. They would just kind of diagnose oh, just kidding. everybody just with kidding. schizophrenia. Everybody has schizophrenia. Yeah. yeah. Um, and said that he was not a threat to society, so they released him. Hmm. Now, where does... Where do all serial killers go after high school? Where do they join? Oh, the military. Yes. He goes and he joins the army. And that doesn't last long because 
He's in the barracks with a freaking weirdo. Well, and they later say that he doesn't have access to heels right now or bras or panties. So he is also still a virgin and he's also still doesn't really know, doesn't know how to masturbate. So he's having, he's flipping out in the middle of the night because he says this Korean woman is trying to come in and rape him. (laughs) Okay. And so he's screaming, like literally screaming in the barracks every night, crying. So they make him see a doctor and the doctor basically says, this is in your head. There's no Korean woman trying to come and rape you. There's something wrong with you, and he's basically, like, dismissed <laughs> from the military. And so it's like, does he does he just have too much pent-up jizz inside of him? I don't know. I don't, how does he not to release? How to, why doesn't he know how to masturbate? I don't know. It's like you accidentally fall, figure that out when you're in the shower or something. Like I know. Cleaning I don't, yourself. I don't know. I, I know. I know. Um. He does eventually learn how to masturbate. Okay, so he moves. He's out of the military. He moves back home. His mom still hates him, so he's sleeping in the shed behind the house. <laughs> but he gets a great job as a radio broadcaster. Oh, god! He'd probably be a podcaster these probably days. Um, and he's good at his job, and he's smart, and he makes a couple friends. And one of them fixes him up with a 17-year-old like girl named Darcy. Oh, no. She sounds like she's going to get murdered. Darcy doesn't name. get ma- murdered, but Darcy, we're gonna we're gonna call her dumbass Darcy. A couple oh times. no, Darcy was shy. She came from a controlling household. They dated a little bit. She wasn't really um, attracted to him, but he wined her and dined her, and they were together. They had sex, and she got pregnant, and so then they got married because that's what you do. Yep, when yep. you get pregnant, right? Mm-hmm. So, she later says that it was never extra kinky in the bedroom. But what he did make her do, Caroline, tell me if you would be okay with walking around the house naked every day. If you were doing chores, you had to be naked. Oh. Oh. I don't think I I don't think. No? No. What about you had to wear heels too? Oh, the hell no. I'd much naked. rather be naked, but I'm not wearing heels. <laughs> naked and high heels was the rules. She had to be all the time. Oh. Um, oh, she also had to um, pose at any point so that he could use his whole roll of camera film <sighs> and take pictures of her. And she... You she, must pose now. So at first it was like new, you know, marriage, like fun stuff. Like, Hey, you should wa- you should go vacuum naked with heels on. Yes, yeah, that's hot. But then um, she's pregnant; she has a baby, and sh- and and he's like, get on get on the kids' bicycles and pose naked. <laughs> <laughs> so it like goes to the toys. She's like, oh, it's a little much. But after you know you get pregnant and fat, you don't feel like being naked all the time anymore. Yeah, and bitch's back starts hurting. Oh, wearing his no. heels and oh, her knees no. are hurting. So she starts putting her foot down and she's like, I'm not going to do this anymore. Mm. And he doesn't like this. Unacceptable. Unacceptable. Can't have it. Can't and have so it. she, he wasn't able to control her like he was, right? Mm-hmm. He drove around downtown Portland and he found a girl and he didn't really care about the girl because she had on badass heels. So he followed her back to her apartment, waited until she went to bed, snuck in her house to steal those heels that he loved so much and some panties. But she woke up and she tried to turn on the lamp. But before she did, he knocked her out and she was unconscious. And there, for the first time ever, he will rape a woman. Mm. So it kind of escalates a little bit, right? So he broke into somebody's house, and then he tried to beat a girl to take pictures. Now he breaks into her house, and this is the first time that he rapes her. So he rapes her, and he takes her underwear, and he takes her bra, and he loves looking at her limp body. And um, 
he feels great after this. So he's like, this is going to be a new routine for me. Oh, gosh. And it's January of 1968 when he escalates to the Encyclopedia Girl. So that's where we're at now. Mm -hmm. The one that at the beginning of the story, okay? This has been a Rogue Media Podcast. Welcome to One Star Rewind, a new podcast about those dreaded one star reviews that every business owner hates to receive, but yet every customer loves to read. During this podcast, we will peel back that one star review to better understand how it happened, when it happened, and what the business owner is doing after receiving that one star review. This podcast will be about love, hate, and laughter. On One Star Rewind, we will meet with real business owners will tell their stories and how they do rely on reviews for their business. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or download us at roguemedianetwork.com. Please subscribe, but only rate and review for not a one-star review. Join us each time for a new review and a new story. This is Sarah. And I'm Carter. And this is Some of Our Thoughts. We're two Southern sommeliers, and we want to share everything we love and know about wine. We started hanging out during quarantine and cooking and drinking and listening to music, and we just thought this would be a great way to bring everything we know to you guys. We will make wine knowledge and food pairings easy and approachable. So put on your favorite vinyl, grab your favorite glass of wine, tune into our show, and let's have some fun. Wine, wine and vinyl. vinyl. <laughs> so check us out on roguemedianetwork.com or wherever you get your favorite podcast. We'll be talking about a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what are we doing here, Rusty? What are we going to do? Uh, yep, we're doing the uh, King of the Hill Rewatch Podcast. King of the Hill yes, Rewatch sir. Podcast. Yeah, so we're going to go through one episode at a time. Uh, come along for the ride with us. Come check it out. And hey, give me give me a good, um, like, Dale Gribble quote to go out on. Wingo! Yeah, Wingo. <laughs> Wingo. Wingo. All right, well, join us, uh, join us for uh, the uh, King of the Hill Rewatch Podcast. In the heart of Texas, that drinks his brew and he spits his chew. Live in the heart of Texas, the TV players, but no one cares. Live in the heart of Texas. Here we go. Okay, so they move to Salem, Oregon, and he has this perfect garage detached garage it's going to be perfect for his his slash his kill room yeah but when they get there he can't find a job he can't find a job he's having these bad migraines so he's just kind of moping around the house his wife makes a comment to him one day and says you're gaining weight but she was already big she says she's calling him fat <laughs> at the dinner table and he gets he's up like, bitch i ain't fat <laughs> he gets up like he's pissed he goes somewhere, and when he comes back, he has on a bra that is stuffed, a girdle, stockings with those little clips. Yes. He's like, how do I look now? And that is exactly what he says. How do I look now? Do I look fat now? Oh! And But he was so dead serious, and she busts out laughing because she doesn't know what to think. 
and she's kind of creeped out. And he goes back upstairs and he comes back down and they never talk about it again. But like those weren't her underwear. Those weren't her, bro. Like she didn't ask no questions. She wasn't like, did you just have that in your drawer? Or she wasn't like, where did you get those? Whose what? are those? Those aren't my size. Those aren't my. Like they just never talked about it again. Well, that's normal. That's totally normal. This is like where she's kind of dumbass Darcy. Um, she also says that she looks through something in the attic one time and she finds a whole roll of developed film of naked pitch or pictures of him dressed up in women's like undergarments, like posing in prayer, very provocative <laughs> poses. And she asked him about it and he says it was a joke. And then now he's not, al- she's not allowed to go back into the attic. She's also not allowed to go into her own garage and go into their own deep freezer. So he has to ask, she has to ask permission for that. This is so, so weird. Stuff, yeah, little bitty stuff that she just like didn't ask questions about. She could have, but she just didn't because what else was she going to do? Oh my I don't know. There was just a couple of I just of don't flags. get how that is uh, uh, what a guy wants to wear. I don't even want to wear it. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I mean, he's. She's basically married to Caitlyn, and she, before Caitlyn, he was the first Caitlyn. Yeah. Well, B, when was BTK? After him? Because he uh-huh. did the same thing. He BTK dressed up. was 80s. Like, nowadays, if you if you are a guy walking around in women's clothing, like, that's totally normal. It's normal, It's yeah. just like, oh, yeah, there's my sister, but they're it's really my brother. Ahead. Listen, they were way ahead of their time. Yeah, they were. So it's May of 1968, and he wanted to kill again. So he gets an idea to dress up like a woman. Oh. He wears I bet he's a cute one. heels. He puts on a dress and a wig, and he goes to the parking lot of a shopping center. And he's looking for a victim. He's looking for a victim, right? He's dressed up as a woman because he doesn't think, he thinks that if you're a woman in a parking lot and you see a man, you'll be scared and you'll be aware. If you just see another woman. Oh, yeah. No, especially one that looks like him. And that is true because he spots 19-year-old Karen Sprinker. Um, Karen was supposed to be meeting her mom for lunch, and she never showed up. Mom got a little nervous. Well, Bruto saw her, held a gun to her, and said, if you don't scream, I will not shoot you. He held the gun to her head. She begged, don't shoot me. I will cooperate. Please don't shoot me. So she gets in the car with him. Mm. You never go to that second location, right? Mm. He stuffed her in his car, and they go back to his house, and they go to his garage. He raped her. He asked her if she was a virgin, and she was. And so then he raped her. Oh, gosh. While she was on her period. Oh, no. Um, Because he talks about he had to take the Tampax out. Oh. He made her try on all of his clothes, all of his women's clothes, pose for a bunch of pictures. And you can find these pictures on the internet. They're kind of scary. Um, And when he was done with the pictures, he wrapped rope around her neck. He clipped it on to this come along pulley that he had hanging in his garage, like Mm. ceiling. He hoisted her up there just enough so that her heels are dangling and touching the floor. He liked hearing the heels touch the floor. Oh, and he strangled her. He kept her hanging, dressed her a couple of times, a couple more times. Cut off her breast because he wanted to keep Ugh. her pieces of her. And he tried to stuff them like with this resin because he wanted a mold of them. Like he knew they weren't going to last just like oh, that, but oh he wanted gosh. a mold of them because. So, like, they the would be skin his paperweight. Uh huh. Stuff in. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yep. Oh, so he stuffed it, and then he, like, put some type of resin or glue to make a mold in there, and it never worked out. But he was like, it would be great to have her boobs as a paperweight. Oh, yeah. So I love I'm boob paperweights. Working. Yeah. It didn't work at all. Mm. He went upstairs to go eat <laughs> dinner with his family, 
and spent time with his wife. And after dinner, Gosh. he went back downstairs and he raped her dead body. So now he's a necrophilia. Oh, no. I know. No, it's just, just getting worse. Winning, winning, winning at life. Um, he dresses her up one last time, puts the bra on, but stuffs the bra with some paper towels because he had cut her boobs off and he didn't want her to bleed in her car. He ties her to a car engine cylinder, dumps her off this bridge. It's called uh-huh. the Bundy Bridge. <gasps> oh yes. Gosh. Even there's nothing good about Bundy even way back then. Bundy Bridge and dumps her into the river. Ooh. That is his second victim. Six months later, on no- in November, Jan Wheatley is driving up the I-5 freeway. And that's the freeway that's like goes straight from Canada to Mexico. There was mm-hmm. an I five killer, act serial killer, actually. Yeah. Too. And her car had broken down, and he spotted her on the side of the road. And he pulled over and he says, "Hey, I'm a mechanic. I can help you, but oh I don't have my tools. I don't want to leave you out here by yourself. Can you get in the car? Why don't you just ride with me to go get my tools?" And then I need to get a part, and I'll come back, and I'll fix your car. Great. Jan's, like, in the middle of nowhere, so she gets in the car. And on this trip, they drive an hour back to his house, okay? Mm -hmm. He drives far to get victims. And they have great conversation. Like, he's friending her and gaining her trust. Grooming her. And he pulls up to his house, and... He says, let me go in. Let me go tell my wife what we got to do because I'm going to be late for dinner and I'll be right back. And when he comes back, he sits in the back seat behind her and he goes, hey, play this. Let's play this game. Uh -uh. He has a strap in his hand, but she doesn't know it. He goes, he says, close your eyes. You can't use your hands. You can't. You can only use words. Describe to a blind person how you would tie your shoe. I mean, yeah, how you would tie your shoe. And so she was like, what? And they had been playing like weird games like that the whole ride there. So she closes her eyes and she starts to, and that's when he strangles her (gasps) from the back seat. Then he, once she's almost dead, he goes to the front seat with her, turns her over, rapes her from behind as he's choking her, when she's dying. Oh, yeah. So that's what Bundy did. Re- yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So choking he her. Would like, he liked feeling the life go out of them. When they're inside of them. Yes. Yes. yes so yes, yes. disturbing. It is so disturbing. Well, what is that even like? I don't know. I'm not. A, <laughs> I don't know. I don't even know, know where to go with my brain. But, oh. That's yep. awful. Yep. yep. Yeah. Power, 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 control, control, control. He took her to the garage. He hoisted her up on his pulley just like the other ones. Well, he didn't even have to hoist her up. There was a hook. He just hooked her neck, like put her neck on this hook and then oh my would dress gosh. her. Had a blast with her, play dress up. He also cut off her breast tried to use a different method to preserve them and this didn't work um and he was so sad about that like he just felt so mad so now he so he started off as a thief then he was a rapist then he was a murderer and a necro now he's a necrophiliac yeah and he leaves her there while he goes on vacation with his family okay well okay and while they're gone, Caroline, which oh, is no. so random, a girl loses control of her car driving on their street and drives her car through his garage. <laughs> what? <laughs> That's never happened in the history of nothing. <laughs> drives her car into his garage. Okay. B- busts a good hole. Like, it's not a total hole, but, like, hits the wall, breaks the wall. Yeah. And they call the police. Right into his little dungeon with his friend hanging by the neck. And the police come, but he's on vacation. Nobody answers the door. And the police, they like, you know, take pictures of the outside, but they don't want to penetrate because 
the entry. They don't want to go inside because the owner's not there. So they'll just wait for him to come back. And so when he got back, he had a message of what happened. And so he <laughs> took the you. body. He has a hole in his house. <laughs> he took the body to the shed out back, called the police over. The police came. They did their investigation. They took pictures of the inside. They filed the report, called the insurance. He got his insurance money. Garage got fixed. And this just made him feel so powerful because the police were right there. Oh, my god! And he had a dead body right there, and they had no idea. Um, what? He felt untouchable. And this was his one of his close calls, like Brian Koberger. Uh-huh. I thought, uh, well, I guess when I did this, I was thinking that was his close call. But like Dahmer, he got pulled over with the body in his trunk. Oh, yeah. Kemper got pulled over um, with the body in his trunk. And so the fact that they can talk them their way out of these situations makes them feel so good. Oh, my gosh. So when they leave, um, when they leave, he brings her back in. And he... Ties her to some railroad track irons, dumps her in the same river with the other bodies. Um, and then along with Linda, Encyclopedia's girl's foot, because now it was too old and he couldn't play with it and dress it up in different shoes anymore. So he <laughs> ties something to that and dumps Linda's foot in the river as well. Okay. I know, I know, I know. Okay. So... um. It's April 1969, and he sees a girl named Sharon Wood. She was, uh, you know, the park-in levels, like the different park-in, um, mm -hmm. what are they called? Park Lots, garage. but there's, yeah, parking garages. Well, she was on the basement level. And he, this time, he dresses up as a cop and, like, a security guard, and he approaches her about... Uh, is this the one? No, he's dressed up as a woman again, and he approaches her with a gun. But this bitch is a fighter, Ooh. so she's screaming, she's fighting. She takes that gun and she wraps it. She like twists the gun in his hand, and his finger gets stuck into it. She bites his hand, his other oh, hand. Oh, hell yes. His, almost bites his thumb off. And so he's just trying to get away from her because she's causing too much attention. He grabs her head, slams it on the ground, thinks he knocks her out, and then he just walks calmly to his car because he later says, if I ran, it would bring up more attention, right? But he's pissed because he basically tried to get Ronda Rousey, and it didn't work. <laughs> Bitch was swinging. So that listen, y'all, that's what you do. That is what you do. You yell and you scream and you kick and you fight. Yep. Because the next day he was so pissed that he failed at Sharon. He tried to abduct a 15-year-old girl. She was on her way to school named um, Leanne Brumley. She did the same thing. He says, he goes up to her. He says, I won't hurt you if you get in the car. She screamed. She freaked out. She started swinging, and she took off running, and he's big, so he can't really run. Mm -mm. A woman was outside. She runs into the woman, and they call the police. Oh so this God. is like strike two. So he's like. So he's real mad now. Desperate. The two that fought got away. But Linda Saley wouldn't be so lucky because he goes back. Back to the parking lot. And this is when he acts like he's a security guard. And he sees Linda coming out with bags. And he approaches her about stealing. And says that she was seen stealing. And that she needs to file a report. That he needs to file a report. And so she gets in the car willingly with him. It's not a security car. It's his own personal car. And they drove to his house where she's going to file the report. Okay, Bundy. <laughs> and she go willingly walks into the garage with him and he just ties her up he's like a mixture of all the big everybody ones. Yes. yeah yeah he ties her up she's still alive and he goes upstairs to eat she doesn't scream she doesn't try to leave she actually gets untied well and okay. she stays there this that is what they report as 
her, um, she's just like in total shock where she just can't, she doesn't know what to do. She can't move. Oh. She, she's oh. scared to run. She's just like stuck in her place. So maybe kind of like how they're describing yeah. Dylan did when he, she supposedly saw Koberger at the house. And so he, this made him feel any, even better that when he goes back to the garage, she's not tied up anymore, but she's there. So it makes him feel like she really wants it, like he that she wants to be there with him. So he strangles her, and he hung her up on that Why hook. Why strangle her? her she's neck. just being quiet. Because that's what. I know, because I was going to say, like, if you're not fighting, like, they want you to fight uh-huh. and they want you to struggle. And if you just are, like, limp and don't struggle, then they get mad and they're like, we, this is not, not who I want. I'm letting you go. I know. And I always think, like, that's what I would do if I was in that place. I would act like I like it or just yeah. try not to react because they want that power control. But for him, it just made him feel even powerful, like he had her trained that well, like he, she wanted to be with him. So he still strangled her. He hung her up on the nook, on the hook by her neck. And um, he said that he was inside of her when she died as well. Oh, very good. When she finally did start fighting, that's, what's made him, that's what made him mad. Um, really? So he didn't really like her very much because... <laughs> When he took off her clothes, her areolas were too light. Oh, now he's going to judge her areolas? <laughs> yes. Don't he even said, try to shame us whenever you're over here wearing heels and lingerie. And He was like, they weren't dark enough. They were too light. They were like this pink color. So he didn't even supposed cut to be brown. Them off. He didn't want to. I don't know. He I just did. He just like he just. I guess they don't. They didn't look like the other women's. I mean, there some women do have like bigger, clear, yeah, clear like different shades of areolas. I guess so. I guess he didn't like her shade. But of he areola. wasn't offended by the nipple. <laughs> no, no. So you would be good. Okay. <laughs> okay. Porn, so porn podcast. He didn't cut off her breasts because he didn't like her breasts. And he worked as an electrician at this time. And he wanted to experiment because, you know, he just, he was just kind of mad at her after because she yeah. trusted him. And then she started fighting and him. He and he was let down like by the, the areolas. Like the yeah, he was weirded out. So he got uh, two needles and he stabbed them into her rib cage, right? And then he got these live wires and he tried to shock her. Her because she has metal in her. She was, he was an electrician, so he was trying to shock her to see if she would like dance or like act like she was electrocuted or something from being electrocuted dance. or shocked. Okay. And he, she didn't do anything. Like it didn't work. And so this kind of made him mad. She, he raped her a couple times when she was dead, and he kept her for about two nights. And, and then he tied to the car engine and threw her off the bridge. Mm-hmm. Pattern. And it reminded me of Dahmer's experiments. Remember, he was trying to, like, um, drill holes and put all this stuff in the mm-hmm. head and make, like, the zombies or whatever. He was, like, doing these electrician experiments on so her. Weird. Um, so now the police are, like, women, young women are going missing. Oh, they finally realized they, that after yeah. 14 have gone missing. <laughs> they know some shit's about to go down. They don't know the term serial killer yet because it wasn't coined. And they don't even know if the missing women like are related. But and then they have yet to find any bodies, but they just know these little college girls are going missing. Yeah. So they needed a break because they didn't have anything. And they caught a break in 1969 when a fisherman saw something in the water that looked like a body, saw the hair, realized it was a body, and it was 19-year-old Karen Sprinker, the one oh, that he abducted. She, she floated to the top. Yes, yeah. They brought in divers, and they also found Linda Saley there. And wow. now they knew these killings were related because they were both tied. They both had electrical wire, rope. They had um. special knots. In this rope, oh. and they were attached to car parts. 
So enter Detective Doherty, Detective Stovall, and Detective Frazier. They were DTF. They profiled before profiling was a thing. So Jim Stovall and Rule really talks about him in the book. Mm -hmm. He sat down the pen and paper and he was like, I need to figure out what type of guy we're looking for. So, so it's like Mindhunter. Yes, yes. Yeah. But before Mindhunter, like yeah. before it was a yeah. thing. So he's doing basically what they do off Criminal Minds. He was getting a profile. So he got a piece of paper and a pen and he wrote numbered. Number one, he says that um, he used this. He had a criminal background, psychology, like a little bit. So he was using that. And he says this guy's got to be between the age of 20 and 30. And big and strong because the victims were kind of in that age range. Uh -huh. And he's got to be big and strong because those car parts weigh a whole lot. Plus the weight of a body. He's like got to be able to bench or deadlift 300 yeah. pounds or more of average intelligence and skills because these knots were um, certain type of knots. He also profiled that he would be an electrician because of the copper wire that's being used on the bodies and the type of knots that were on there were knots that electricians do with mm. copper wire. Commonly. Oh, wow. That he would be that he would come from a bro bro either a broken home or have a strong, demanding um, mother. Mm. He also hates women. He would have a record of antisocial behavior, which he does when he was in that crazy house. He was not an athlete because he was they were strangled and not beaten. And I guess strangling somebody is a lot easier where beating would require a lot of like um, physical uh, stamina. Yeah, and stamina. And so they didn't think that he had it. He would not be a steady worker because they go missing at different hours of the day and that he's driven by some type of cycles and maybe menstrual cycles because all of the girls vanished at the end of the month and they were all on their period. So they went missing like the 26th, the 28th. and it's But it's weird. That How do they even know that? Because... Um, well, one, the parents that went missing, they were like, well, maybe she had bad cramps and she had to go to the hospital. So they would check the emergency room. And so oh things that gosh. the parents would say, like after interviewing, it all came out that they were on their cycle. Plus he said he had to pull out tampons. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh my gosh. But he never really said that he did that on purpose, which it made me think was his wife also on his. That was a weird sound. <laughs> Was his wife also on on the cycle? And so that's when he would go find other women because he couldn't have sex with his wife during that time. Oh, my gosh. I Does know. she still have sex with him? <laughs> so gross. Yeah. So he basically did what the BAU did now, and he was basically describing Brodus <clears throat> to a T. And so they know they have a killer, but they don't know where to start. So they decide to go to the local college. It's Oregon State University. And they are like, you know, a bunch of these kids did go to Oregon State and they're in college. So maybe one of them has seen the killer and not really known. Or maybe they've gone on a date. So they talk to a bunch of college girls and they tell them, kind of what's going on. They found these bodies. And what they found out is that Brutus, Brutus, what's the name? Brutus. Brutus was randomly calling the college dorms. Okay? Mm -hmm. I guess you just have one phone. But he would call the dorms and he would ask for, like, basic white girls' names. Is... Karen there? <laughs> is Jennifer there? Louise? <laughs> is, is Amy there? And guess what? There's a couple of them there. So they would be <laughs> like, oh, Amy so-and-so. And so he would yeah. just pick one. When they got on the phone, he would spark a conversation. And he's a good conversationalist. And then he would ask them on a date. And he got a couple dates. Like Over this. the, just randomly? Yeah. They I'm going to start calling up some frat houses. <laughs> <laughs> Call up, Carol, you got the wrong M.O., Caroline. <laughs> 
You trying to go on these dating sites? All you gotta do is just cold call. <laughs> so he went on a bunch of dates with these bunch of random girls. Wow. Well, one girl, and they would what they would all say is they would he would ask them about these missing girls. What do you think about those missing girls? Because there were missing posters up everywhere, right? Oh my god! So they would get rid weirded out. He also told one girl, so what made you get in the car with me? Like, how do you know that I just wasn't going to strangle you and dump you in the river? Oh, my God. So when they told the detectives this, they were like, this is our guy. Yeah. They said, um, did he leave a number? Did y'all plan a second date? And she goes, well, he said he was going to call. But, you know, people say that all the time. So they said, if he calls... If he calls, we want you to stall him. Agree to meet with him, but stall him. Then call us, and we you don't have to see him at all. We will meet him. We'll yeah. protect you, okay? So 10 days later, Jerry calls one of these girls. I forgot her name. And Amy. Probably Amy. <laughs> he calls up Amy. He calls Jennifer. He calls Crystal. And he says, hey, let's meet. I can be there in 15 minutes. Oh, he seemed like really thirsty, really desperate. And she goes, oh, I would love to meet, but I just can't right now. I need to wash my hair. It's like filthy. And I want to be able to get dressed up. And he tried to push her and say, you don't need to dress up. Just come now. Come now. And she says, I can. I can't meet in 15 minutes, but I can meet in 45. So he says, but. Oh, yeah. So she calls the police. And they they're supposed to meet downstairs in the lobby of the dorm. Jerry walks in. He sits down. He's waiting on her. And the detectives are there, and they just talk to him. And they give him a car, and they ask him a couple questions. And Jerry Brudos is cool, calm, and collect. Oh, he leaves. No. But now they have a tell on him. <gasps> okay? So they're just kind of watching what he's doing here and there. He's just a... Did he call the girl, ask her why she never came? Uh, No. No. Mm. Because I think he kind of knew that they were on to him. Yeah. Um, They go and visit him at his house. And he invites them into his workshop. Okay. His garage. Yeah. And they're just investigating the missing girls, they said. And he goes, oh, yeah, that's real sad. They see his pulley and some rope and, like, some wire tied up in this special type of electrician knots that were found Mm. on the wire on the Mm -hmm. body. So he sees them admiring that, and he goes, oh, you like that knot? Here, you can have it. Take it with you. So he's kind of like taunting them a little bit. Yeah. Um, And so they took it, and sure enough, it's the same exact knot that was on the bodies, right? Um, And so then they remember... A girl named Sherry Wood that was attacked in the parking lot. And so they get Sherry Wood in and they said, if you could, if we showed you a picture, could you identify him? And she said, yeah. So they went back to his house and they asked him for a picture. Oh my gosh. This is when he freaked. He's like, oh yeah, sure. Here's my, here's a picture. But he kind of freaks out a little bit. So he tells his wife, let's go visit your parents that I hate in another state. (laughs) <laughs> and so Darcy's dumb ass is like, okay, sure. Why are the police talking to you? I don't know. <laughs> yes. Why are the police? Yeah. Why are the police talking to you and you all of a sudden want to go to my parents' house that you hate in another state? <laughs> and so Sherwood identifies Brodus as the person who attacked her. The other little girl that he attacked the next day identifies him. And so now they know they have Brutus. When they pull Darcy over as she's driving out of town, Jerry is in the back seat um, covered up with the blanket, like under the cover, like laying down uh-huh. in the back seat. Like he he's hiding. He's like shaking and crying. Oh, my god! And so he gets arrested. And the wife is like, why are they arresting you? And, she, and he says, oh, um, I have a gun that's illegal and it's not registered or it's not my name or something. So I just have to go to jail for a little bit, but um, I'll be back. I'll call you from jail. 
Oh my gosh. And she's like, okay. So oh, she follows no. him to jailhouse. <laughs> she's like, okay, honey. Within no time, he starts talking and he's like confessing to everything. Each detail with no remorse, like person by person by person. And then he calls his wife because he calls his wife and he says, hey, go upstairs to the attic. Get my box of women's clothing and all these pictures. Go burn that for like go dump it. Go burn it because <laughs> he thinks he doesn't know that they have bodies. Oh my yet. gosh! So he thinks he can confess. She's like, but you but love no wearing evidence. it all. <laughs> but you look so good in but it. But you look so good that one time. <laughs> so he doesn't. She's she thinks about it and she's like, well, you know, I always do what he tells me to do. But she calls up, I think, a friend or a lawyer, and she asks him, and they said, "If you no, the police. She says, Jerry wants me to throw away <laughs> some stuff. <laughs> do you think I should? And they said, if you do, you're an accessory. Yeah, you dumbass. To murder. He's not in jail for, for a, a gun. gun. It's for murder. And so she goes, oh. Oh, I had no She's idea. She's still going to visit him. She's still going to, like, take the kids. It's kind of really oh, pisses, my. Me, pisses no, me off. Oh, no, 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 no. Well, um, he tries to plead guilty by reason of insanity. And so, of course, you have to have all these tests done. And yeah. psychologists look at you. And that was ruled out because he had above average intelligence. And in the book, Ann Rule says that one of the doctors said he had 166 IQ. That's like off the charts. Casey's probably mouth is dropping right now. <laughs> now, I could not see that anywhere else. So I don't know if it was like a typo or if it was really written and official. But they did say it was above average. That's more than that's higher than Kemper, Bundy and Dahmer. Oh, that's. But nobody knew because everybody just always thought he was a dumbass. He would work, you know, like he never really went to college. Yeah. So I couldn't find that anywhere. So don't quote me on that. But I did see it in Ann Rule's book. He was also um, diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder manifested by fetishism, transvestitism. Transvestitism. <laughs> I, I was like, is that an ism? <laughs> voyeurism exhibitionism and sadism and he was declared competent to stand trial wow he, he knew what he was doing was what he was doing um and he showed no remorse okay but before they went to trial they didn't have to because he pled guilty and he confessed to everything oh and he got my gosh three consecutive life sentences because um there's no death penalty in Oregon at mm. this time. And only three, he killed four women because they never found the body of the encyclopedia girl. Really? So he did not get punished. Even though he confessed, described in detail, they couldn't even, if they could link her to the house, like if they had found her encyclopedia books or something, then they probably could have done it. But without the body and without any evidence, they mm. couldn't. So um, there was no trial, and the people in the community were pissed. Like, people want to watch it play out. Imagine it was like... Koberger. I mean, yeah. Yeah. It kind of reminded me of Delphi, because here's all these women missing, right? And they were missing for a little bit. His reign was only like two years. And then you find out, like, the local electrician in this nice house gets arrested, and you find out he's got a wife and kids because you think is it's going to be a madman, but he's like a normal man, right? Mm -hmm. So they want to see this play out. They don't see this play out, and they're mad, and they want somebody to blame, so they blame Darcy. And this uh. one Karen comes forward, and she says that she actually was at her sister's house, who's neighbors with Brutos, and that at 1.15 p.m. on this day, that she saw Brutus and Darcy carrying a woman's body covered in a blanket to his garage workshop. From oh, the car so to she his was in workshop. on it. Okay. And um, so they took Darcy to trial. She <gasps> lost her kids. Oh, shit. They 
it's crazy, like, how she lost her kids. Her kids had to go with her parents, but um, the woman was lying. She didn't have anything oh, to do with it. Because hell. they were like, bitch, why didn't you call the cops then? Why are you calling the cops? Why are you t- saying this two days later? So no. they, they just went after Darcy. Darcy had to um, finally move to another state, change her name, change the kid's name. And she lost everything because what the state did is they went to the house and they sold all of his stuff for money to pay for the tr- for what the investigation and police yeah. hours and stuff. I've never really heard of that. No, like you, it's like they had a garage sale or something and sold all their stuff. And I <laughs> bet it would be worth a lot more because of who he was. Kind of like they did Dahmer's stuff. Ugh. They sold all his stuff and gave that money to the family. Um, when he was in jail, he was ridiculed. He got his ass whooped because nobody likes a pervert. Nobody likes a woman killer. Um, he was in jail for 38 years. He had a broken back neck and a broken back during that time. Good. He was the longest running criminal like that had been there the longest, like at Oregon at that time. He never showed remorse. He finally died in 2006 of colon cancer, some type of cancer. But before he died, yeah, he died from cancer in 2006. But before he died, Ann Rule says that she went and visited him. Oh, no. And he enjoyed talking about everything. And when she asked him, did he feel sorry for the women? Or how do you feel about the woman that he killed? There was a piece of paper on the table. He <laughs> grabs the piece of paper. He balls it up. And he throws it on the floor, floor and he says... I feel for those women about the same as I feel for that piece of paper. Oh, no. I know. <gasps> I know, I know, I know. Oh, no. Um, a doctor later on said that women was is like a stick of gum to him. Like, you put it in your mouth, you chew it up, and when it loses its taste, you, like, throw it away. Oh no! That's the worst. So this there's Brutus. The worst. This Brutus. guy is the worst. He's ugly. I, okay. I think is that why does like his he's not really talking. I know. About. I know. So um, and that's what I was gonna say too. Okay, so when they when something like this happens, right? People who go to you go to school with what's happened to Koberger right now? People he goes to school with, they're bringing out yearbook pictures, any pictures that they have, they're coming out and they're talking about them. Nobody in the world remembered him his lawyer went to the same high school as him graduated in the same year and they're in the same homeroom and his lawyer had no recollection of him like he was a nobody he was just invisible he was invisible invisible and so he was doing this to be visible and Nobody and, and they still don't I even know. know. <laughs> I know people still have no idea who he is, and the only reason, okay, if you remember that part on my Mind Hunters, they come in to talk to him, and when they talk to him, the only way he'll talk is because they brought him some shoes, and then on Mind Hunters they have him turning around. And he's like masturbating with the shoes in his hand. <laughs> oh my gosh! Of course he is. Of course. And I, it was so random, and I was like, "This can't be a real person." And he's a real person. He loves his heels. I don't. Yeah, that's so crazy that he's not bigger or more talked about. I know it is. A, he should be. It is a. I mean, it's it's different. It is, and maybe because I mean, like his count was four. Oh, no, people too low. like numbers. Yeah. yeah. Maybe it was too low. And then, like, then he was followed by Kemper, who had a ton. And then, mm-hmm. um, and BTK, the or Bundy. Strangler and Bundy and Dahmer, um, Ed Gein. Like, he was, he preceded all of them. And nobody ever says Brutus. Mm-mm. We don't like you, Brutus, because you're disgusting and you're. There's a good documentary fat. out about him. It's called um, Worst Killers Ever, I think, on Amazon Prime. Oh, there's an episode yeah. on him about that. But there you go. That's Brutus. Good story. Think about him every time you put on your heels and your stockings. And you were safe if you didn't wear heels. Oh, I'm safe. So we would have been safe. Oh, yeah. Never will I put Total- on any heels. Totally safe. 
Good reason not to. Y'all, that was a mouthful. Thank you for your attention. Um, And there's a serial killer for you. I love it. I love it. I love it. Go uh, share this episode with a friend who loves serial killers or some of our other episodes. And tell a friend to go listen to us. Go send us a review. And anything else? I don't know. Follow us on all the socials. Yeah. Instagram, Facebook. Go to Four Sigmatic Coffee and order you some. Foursigmatic.com. Go dot foursigmatic.com slash slash happy happy hour. hour. 30% off. And we will see you next time. Don't forget to stay aware. Stay alive. And always be DTF. Bye, y'all. Bye. This has been a Rogue Media Podcast.